Hello and welcome to another very special episode of the Self Optimistified podcast. We are joined by Mohamed Kerbeck of Asserta, based in Waterloo, Canada. Hi, Tom. It's great to meet you. Uh, a pleasure. So, Mohamed has an interesting background. So, from educationally, a marketer, which is great to hear because, as everyone knows, I'm also a marketer. Um, but then, for the last five years, has been in the RevOps space uh, for smaller companies. Um, and also consults independently, is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. Um, so, Mohammed, welcome to the show. What I want to know is how you transitioned from marketing into operations, because surely you would have just wanted to stay in marketing because it's so great. <laughs> and uh, not to discount the value of marketing at all uh, or, the, or the good time that I had there, but uh, I feel like my, uh, m- my background in marketing was more aligned to the data and insights side of the equation. So uh, after initially starting out as a brand marketer, I made the transition. Uh, I made the transition to market research, and I pursued education accordingly. Uh, what that quickly led me into is uh, <clears throat> operations teams within smaller companies, where they typically act as the central nervous systems for you know sales market. Uh, sales, marketing, even customer success somewhere down the funnel, right? Uh, And to that, you know, I pretty much haven't looked back from there. It was initially a more marketing analytics focused uh, job description and then transitioned into, you know, the whole function, uh, the whole revenue function, if you will. All right. So would you advise, so if you're internally within a company trying to recruit into, into operations from anywhere, you would try and find the most like metric driven people in other departments. I would say that's one way to look at it for sure. Um, if you look at um, if you look at how operations typically functions, there are several mantras where skill sets can be very transferable. So enablement, for example, is one of those. Uh, a lot of people prioritize people with sales experience or enablement experience when hiring for operations teams because of the contextual know how that they would have. Right, makes for sense. But uh, yeah, as a as a metrically driven individual, I guess I'd share that bias. Start with the data first. Right. Got it. And how many? I think you said about thirty people at Asserta at the moment. That's correct. Yeah. And how many people in sales? Right now, our sales team is comprised of five in uh, well, sorry, four in account executive positions. We also have uh, we also have four people operating in business development and uh, an individual handling our partner channels as well. Got it. So five plus nine plus one. Um, And then how many within the operations team? The operations team right now is myself and two others. Awesome. Okay, cool. So that is, oh yeah, but that team spans the whole of the revenue operation, not just sales, right? Yeah. So uh, like it's, we're at the size now where like we operate kind of cross-functionally, right? We, uh, we have people lending their skill set across different areas, but yeah, by and large, Got across. It. Would you say that the majority of your time is spent with the sales team? At this point, I would probably say yes. Um, we have a healthy amount of focus on uh, on customer acquisition at this moment in time, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, we do employ uh, we do employ a very direct selling strategy at this moment, where marketing's role hasn't yet evolved from enablement. So most of my time is focused with the with the sales team. Got it. So just to check, I understand. So when you say a direct selling strategy, your salespeople are going out there and finding customers, and then the marketing team are like giving them content to enable them to do that. Is that exactly? We're uh, in the infancy of developing an inbound uh, an in- an inbound strategy right now. So it's uh, mm-hmm. you know exciting exciting times. But uh, but by and large. Uh, our legacy has been sales team going out and getting the leads and marketing simply supporting them with the various documents that are required across the funnel. Got it. And then what is the current tech stack like across marketing success and sales? Sure. So we use, um, <clears throat> we use, uh, we use Zoom info. Uh, so we use Zoom info and LinkedIn Sales Navigator to procure to procure to procure lists, if you mm-hmm. will. Um, Salesforce is our CRM. Uh, Salesforce is our, is our CRM of choice, and we have Outreach as a uh, Outreach as a choice tool for sales engagement. Mm-hmm. Uh, at the very top on marketing, we uh, we use tools like Zoom to conduct webinars. We're a little light for marketing automation at this point in time, mm-hmm. so 
we, uh, we've been dabbling with sending out newsletters. So we use things like MailChimp and we use, uh, we've run a couple of webinars and we're aiming to evolve that. Uh, and we're using Zoom for that right now. And obviously uh, in the background to make all this work, uh, there is Zapier. Got it. Yeah. You yeah. sound like a passionate Zapier fan. <laughs> I uh, I appreciate the value of things done behind the scenes to ensure that things are running smoothly. Got it. Um, so are you doing anything specifically now to drive the productivity of the, I think it's 15 self people, including AEs, SDRs, and the partnerships person? Uh, 10. Uh, and uh, it's, it, uh, it's a merge of, um, yeah, so we... We, t- we take a system that basically merges accountability, right, uh, mentoring, and and competition, if you will. Our our, uh, our sales team are a bunch of go getters. They're uh, they're pretty great at what they do, uh, but more than anything, <clears throat> more than anything, they love to win. So the competitive element comes out in monthly sales contests that we hold, right? That we build some dashboards for and we provide some incentives. The accountability portion is uh, is really transpired through transparency in the metrics that we share. Right, we opened the forum for biweekly deal reviews to make sure that <clears throat> to make sure that we're on track and that there's a clear and transparent set of next steps associated with every opportunity that we have. Um, but yeah, that's uh, that's more or less it. Got it. So that's like the three pillars to the way you work with salespeople is keeping them accountable, enabling them to learn, and then and uh, facilitating the competition. Yes, absolutely. Got it. Awesome. Um, are you currently managing data quality? I am. Yeah. Uh, and so that's like it. Are you currently like, have you had any recent initiatives to try and improve that? Or are you like pretty happy with how it's going? Uh, no, we've had, uh, not that I'm not happy with how it's going, but uh, data, uh, data quality is almost like a living, breathing animal. So you have to stay on top of it at all points in time. So um, we have uh, initially we built the framework to build to build some dashboards that identify that monitor data d- data flow through our systems right to pinpoint specific gaps that we're looking for right we uh, typically bring up a lot of that in our meeting cadences in order to make sure that it's adequately maintained so I guess actually to kind of go back to that question um, managing data quality as much as someone in operations can manage data quality because it's really a team based initiative. Right, you have to you have to get the rely uh, you have to get the support from marketing and sales. So, and typically, it's um, well, it's a process of compromise, right? Because we're at, we're expecting a significant amount of data to be entered in our in our various systems and platforms. We also want to make sure that our uh, we also want to make sure that our individual reps are able to focus on the things that they need to do. So, it becomes a matter of trade offs between what do we automate, right, and uh, and what do we ensure a manual point of entry for? And then what points do we emphasize uh, or what data, data points do we emphasize and monitor and enforce, if you will? Got it. And when trying to, I want to shift to now working with the salespeople. Mm-hmm. So do you have any tips on how you can build that relationship while still getting them to do the stuff that you kind of need them to do? Good question. Um, I would say the biggest thing is, I would say the biggest thing is get their buy-in. Without with, without their buy-in, you're uh, without their buy-in, you're not going to get far. Uh, the issue with data quality is even the reports around it can be reductionistic, right? In a way where a bird's eye view may not suffice to actually tell you what what are the incomings and outgoings of your system in your systems. So you uh, you can't just say, hey, this field needs to be filled versus you know you need to put this in that field. Otherwise, you're just micromanaging across the board. The the importance of data quality for the organization it really is fundamental to the salespeople themselves, right? It helps them great, gain greater visibility into their perform into their performance and the organize and the organization's performance as a whole, right? Or what's important to the organization to be able to successfully execute as a whole, if you will. And it's by aggregating these insights and leveraging them to inform the sales team where you can really see them be more bought into the process. And that's, that's super important simply because there's a hesitancy to actually run these functions. There's typically a disparity between what do I need in order to actually close this deal versus what do I need in order for management to get off my back. The more that you can merge these objectives together, 
right? The better, the, the better off you are as it pertains to data quality specifically. Interesting. So you're aiming to help or like give the sales rep enough info so that they can effectively close the deal, but then also not have to like spend too much dealing with time dealing with management. Is that right? Uh, yeah. And I would think it's, uh, in the end of the day, like you're you're aiming to create a you're aiming to create an environment where data quality is not a concern, because everyone is vigilant about it. Mm -hmm. Got it. Uh, because it's not just something for the ops team to deal with. It should be like a cohesive uh, approach. And so you do that by getting the salespeople to understand that if they do better with data quality, they're going to get more commission because they'll spend less time. Like in short um, form, yeah, that's a good way to put. Okay, cool. Now, moving on to forecasting, I think you started to talk about this earlier with the biweekly deal reviews. How are you currently forecasting and what does the process look like? Absolutely. So it's uh, actually evolving as we speak. So it's an interesting question that you posit. We, uh, so we do the typical thing, which is associate opportunity stages with specific percentages, right, to be able to understand, to be able to understand get a layman's understanding of where we're going to end up in a particular reporting period, typically a quarter. Uh, <clears throat> with that being said, we typically re uh, we go through a rigorous deal review process in order to make sure in order to make sure that the dates and the expected category uh, the dates and the stages and the expected the expected returns are actually accurately reflected. So uh, more often than not, uh, in our in our forecast calls, we'll be discussing well, why do you think why do you think this is here? Right, and why do you think this is a closed date? And we typically, as everyone else, we get an additional amount of granularity when something enters the planning stage. But with that, uh, so we assign lower percentages up the uh, upwards in the funnel. We uh, we don't really have. Uh, we're very very um, well, for the lack of a better word, paranoid about pipeline before we start entering uh, before we start entering the planning stage. And uh, the, the reason behind that is because we understand that things can fall through a lot. We're still in our infancy, so we're learning quite a bit about the environment we're in. And uh, we uh, so we typically run a weighted forecast method, I guess, to, to, to that effect. Yeah. Got it. And so that you and like the head of sales sitting down individually with each rep to do the reviews? Yes. Yes, that's done. That's done on. Uh, so there's weekly touch points with each rep, and then there is uh, there is also like a biweekly deal review conducted across the board, where it's a it's an open forum. Part of that is to fulfill forecasting. The other part of it is uh, to get the to get the team to leverage uh, to leverage synergies or learnings, if you will. But, yeah. Got it. So that's the everybody sits in on that meeting and everyone updates stages for every deal and then they can kind of crowdsource ideas if they need help yes nice now how to how many people is that process going to scale to do you think i would suspect that uh there's going to come a point in time where we're gonna uh probably once we get beyond the beyond the 15 or sorry even 10 dedicated account executives that we're probably going to have to we're probably going to have to revisit that mm -hmm. uh, I would suspect that uh, it would scale well when you start subdividing by territory because you run the individual activity across uh, across the different territories and then you amalgamate with some key summary points in either monthly or quarterly reviews. But, uh, but yeah, I, I don't think it scales well past 10 in a single room if that's what you're getting at. Yeah, yeah. So that means you're going to be doing more biweekly reviews with multiple groups. You, you would think, yeah, or at least we'd hire for it. If yeah okay do you do you enjoy the meetings <laughs> maybe that's fair yeah, i shouldn't ask that should <laughs> i'm sure you do enjoy the meetings uh, i i do <laughs> they, they can be stressful at times but at mm. the end of the day uh, we're a tightly knit group we have the same focus in mind so that uh, that always kind of helps steer the conversation in the right direction for but, sure yeah. there is of course a healthy degree of tension as yeah. always yeah it wouldn't happen any other way to be honest but, yeah um Cool. And then if you could only measure one revenue related metric again uh, for your whole life, which would you choose? Revenue related across the funnel. Across the funnel. Yeah. I'm going to have to go with net revenue retention. Interesting. So please, please explain. I think I understand, but let's um, make sure the audience is aware. 
For sure. So um, I think in the end of the day, the ability to uh, the ability to measure the success of a business or the uh, the promise of a business, even if you will, right, rests in its ability to expand its revenue base, retain and expand on its revenue base within its existing customers. The uh, the assumption behind it is that we can iterate on execution at the top of the funnel to make it better, right? But uh, the, the revenue retention metric really ties both the success of retention initiatives as well as, as well as product market fit. There's an embedded assumption in there that this is, this is a product that's actually adding value. Um, and that's probably why I would go by that metric above all else. Got it. So if net revenue retention is negative, that means that you're making more money from the same customers after a year, after a specific time period. Yeah. yeah. Got it. And if you have positive net revenue retention, that means that if you're getting 100 grand from 10 customers on day one, on day 366, you're getting less than 100. Yeah. That makes so, sense. Yeah, which is not in and of itself a promising indicator. But yeah. True, but then you could have still added more customers. And the the premise that follows that is uh, there are only so many customers in the world, so you need to keep the ones that you get, right? The acquisition, uh, uh, in addition to that, uh, in the startup world at least, like you know, you're burning through in order to attain growth. But if that growth is dropping off at the the bottom end of the funnel, then it's not a it's not a very friendly picture for the future, if you will. And so if you saw a business with net positive revenue retention, you, the action there would be to let, maybe invest less at the top of the funnel and work out this retention problem before I would, scaling. I would suspect if that's a problem that's consistent, then, then the answer would be yes. I'd be, looking, uh, I'd be looking at investments in product and I'd be looking at investments in customer success right, to, to make sure that we're actually addressing the need that we've sold so well on, if you will or comparatively well on, I guess. Uh, but, uh, but again, you'd also have to account for, you know, individual, um, individual differences or, you know, like uh, outliers, if you will, when you, when you compute that metric. Identifying causality at, a, at mm-hmm. the account level is probably important before we make a proclamation of that metric. Got it, because you might lose this really big customer because they went out of business, right? And so that's not... But then you, uh, and so for this to work, you have to be able to expand across either number of seats or with extra features, right? Or is that like, yeah, you, you'd have to expand the like uh, you'd have to expand the use case, and uh, you have you'd have to expand the use case in general. So number of seats is a good way to look at it, or number of licenses, I guess, if you will. Uh, but yeah, it's really expansion and upsell, really, right? Like here's something else that we've built for you that we think is transferable to you, or here's another application that can engage this specific user group or location. Got it. Nice. Um, and then final question: Who has inspired you the most in the world of revenue operations? Without a doubt, uh, Joe Galata. Uh, Joe, we've had Joe on the show before. Have. I actually He's good, know. isn't he? Yeah, so Joe was my boss at Exonify. Uh, Got it. Yeah, Got the, it. yeah, so remarkable human being, but with, uh, from a professional context as well, uh, probably, uh, probably one of, in my opinion, one of the most foremost thought leaders on revenue operations today. Mm-hmm. And, uh, he's really helped shape my thinking and, uh, you know, I owe everything that I've accomplished in my career to him. Everything? Well, from the that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, okay. For final question then, why is Joe so good? He excels at unifying strategy, uh, strategy to process the systems and insights. He uh, he gets that revenue operations is the uh, or sales operations is the central nervous system to the revenue function, and he understands all the dynamics that that surround that. He can think in the bigger picture, but it's still not averse to coloring uh, to coloring in the detail. Uh, it's that kind of ability to transition between these two mindsets, which is typically very challenging, that makes the, that makes Joe for me unique. Well, big shout out to Joe. Um, Mohammed, thank you so much for those insights. And that, let, let me pick out what I particularly enjoyed. I like the three, the kind of trifecta of working with the sales team. Um, so accountability, learning, and then competition. Um, and that's like applicable, especially the last one. Mm-hmm. Just add like, not like forcing it, but like 
surfacing data so they can compete if like super powerful right it's like indirectly improving um what else do we have here um getting buy-in from salespeople when you're trying to get them to do stuff obviously um net revenue retention we've i've never had that as an answer before i think we've done about 70 75 um i've asked that 75 times i never got that and i think it's because like it I don't think I get asking that to a sales person. You probably wouldn't get that right because you need a more holistic view. And so you, with your background, um, that kind of makes sense that we can have a discussion about this more holistic point. Um, And and then finally, uh, we try and pick out a quote from every episode. And I think that your quote, either about the day's quality of the living, breathing animal, so you have to stay on top of it, or the healthy degree of tension in that forecasting meeting. That One of those is going to be the quote. Fair enough. Fair enough. Thank Uh, you very much for your time. I appreciate it. No worries. Thank you so much, Mohamed. Thank you.